So in our last lesson, we reviewed the story of Isaac's you know, unintentional blessing of Jacob and the results of that, you know, Jacob's deception. And of course, uh, what happened after, well, you know, Esau's ready to kill his brother, so there's you know, negative fallout there. Jacob is sent away for uh, his own protection and hopefully with the hope that he might find a wife among his, his uh, among Rebekah's relatives. And of course, Isaac himself is rebuked by God for his, for his rebellion. So today we're going to you know, get a close up of Jacob and his 20 year separation from his, from his family. So let's open to um, Genesis 28 and begin reading in verse one. It says, So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padam Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So interesting thing that's happening here, if you notice, you're wondering, well, wait a minute, I thought he gave him the blessing. What's he doing giving him another blessing? Well, I think that once Isaac realizes that he has been thwarting the will of God with his stubbornness, he reissues the blessing as well as gives uh, Jacob specific instructions about finding a wife. You know, before, uh, Jacob received the blessing by deceit. You know, uh, Isaac had given it unintentionally, thinking he was giving it to, to Esau. But now, now that you know, uh, Isaac's eyes are open, he's kind of come to himself a little bit, he realizes that he's been fighting God's will, now he gives the blessing openly and freely, and he uses the terms much more in line with the terms that were originally used in giving Abraham the blessing. You see what I'm saying? Uh, note also that Isaac instructs his son to take a wife from among his mother's family, uh, and of course hoping that he will find a believing spouse. He's already had the problem with Esau marrying pagan women. This time he gets a little more specific with Jacob as far as his instructions in finding a wife. So let's keep reading verses six to nine. It says, now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take to himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. At that, Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan Dis, uh, displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, uh, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. So we even see, you know, there's like repentance all around here. You know? Isaac gives the proper blessing and good information. Jacob, the obedient son, listens to his father's instructions, you know, and so on and so forth. And even a little bit of, e of repentance on Esau's part, seeing that his pagan wives were a concern to his parents and that the blessing was now officially and openly Jacob's. No going back now, no struggling for that blessing, it's a done deal. He goes and marries someone more suitable and closer in kinship to Isaac. He marries Ishmael's daughter, his uncle's daughter, like a niece. So he marries closer to the family, not some foreign pagan woman. So we even see a change in heart in Esau to uh, a certain extent. Of course, this is too little and too late, but it does indicate that Esau also was subdued by some of the events that took place. Let's keep reading an interesting, fascinating passage now, Jacob's Ladder. We'll read about that in verse 10. It says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. 
he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending, um, uh, descending on it. A little more. It says, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth and you will be spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So Jacob is alone, you know, try to imagine the human side of this here. He's not a man of the fields like his brother. His brother could go on a trip like this, you know, man of the fields, a hunter, comfortable in the outdoors. Jacob, you know, it says he was a man of the tents. You know, he wasn't the outdoorsman type. Uh, he's never been away from home, close to his mother, and now he's on the run from his, from his brother. Now this passage here uh, describes the first of eight appearances of God to Jacob. It's amazing when you think about it, eight times. You know, God appeared to Jacob more than He appeared to Paul the Apostle, that we know of anyways. Okay? Uh, God had appeared to Abraham, He had appeared to Isaac, and now He appears to Jacob. These were the three that had the blessing. Uh, and he also does so in a dream, and in the appearance he reconfirms the blessings that were pronounced upon him by his father. I mean, his father said it, and that could be encouraging, but the fact that God confirmed the fact that he had the blessing, this is what gave him uh, a spiritual uh, encouragement. So in his mind there would be no doubt that despite his poor method, he did have and he would keep the blessing. Because I mean, you know, a guy would start second guessing himself after a while, right? Man, I, my mother and I conspired to trick my brother and deceive my father to get the blessing. And now I am on the run by myself, alone on the road, going to a place I've never been to. Hmm, I wonder if God is really with me on this deal. I wonder if it's just, you know, it's all in my own mind. And so God appears to him to reassure him that the blessing really does belong for him. Now, the imagery of the dream with a ladder, uh, it's the only time, by the way, that that word is mentioned in the entire Bible, ladder, um, uh, with angels going up and down. What an amazing image. But you know, in the Bible, images mean things. You know, they're types, they, 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 they point us to certain ideas. So this imagery suggests and teaches several things. First of all, uh, it suggests that there is movement between the spiritual world and the physical world. Because what does a ladder do? You know, it connects you to something that's out of reach, you know, whether it be a, a tree or a, you know, whatever. You, know, you, you use a ladder to get to a place that you can't get to just standing. And so the idea is that in the dream, the ladder connects heaven and earth, okay? And that there is a connection between heaven and earth. Secondly, um, it demonstrates that angels' tasks are to move between heaven and the world to minister to those who are part of the promise. The angels don't minister to sinners. The angels don't minister uh, to unbelievers and pagans. They minister to those who are heirs of the promise. And we learn more specific details later on about angels, 2 Kings, Daniel 9, Mark 1, you know, and so on and so forth. We see the appearances of the angels to Mary and to Joseph, and, and we see them ministering to Jesus Himself. Uh, but this here, this is an early indication of this phenomenon. There, there had been no teaching about this. There had been no understanding about this idea. Uh, specifically until we see it appear. And then thirdly, uh, the ladder or the link between the two is Christ. 
In John, and I don't have this on the, on the board, I'll just read it uh, from my Bible. In John chapter one, verse 51, Jesus says to him, it says, Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So there's an allusion, if you wish, to that Old Testament passage there. What do we call those? We call them types, right? And there is a, a type, but a very obscure one, if you wish. You know, it's not that clear. But Jesus mentions this, this, this up and down situation with the angels moving between you know, heaven and earth. And the ladder, we're wondering, well, what's the ladder represent? Well, Christ is the ladder. He is our bridge between this place and the next place, not the angels. The angels are not the ones that bring us to heaven, so to speak. You know, they're not the mediators. They're not the go-between. Jesus is the go-between. So the imagery here you know, doesn't explain this to Jacob, except in a very oblique way, but rather um, uh, later on in the Bible, Jesus uses it to refer to himself, as I've read from John. The angels minister to the saved by the power of and on behalf of Christ who is the link between heaven and earth. So we move along to uh, verse 16. I'm not going to read it all here, just summarize some of it. Jacob awakens from his dream and he does several things which are significant. First, he builds a pillar to commemorate the spot where God met and appeared to him in this dream and he offers a sacrifice of oil on. And a pillar is just stones, you know, stones that are one on top of another. Now later on, he's going to return and actually build um, an altar there in Genesis 35. He actually builds an altar at this very same place. Uh, he had, whoops, I'm a little too fast. Um, he names the place. Uh, he names the place Bethel, which means um, which means uh, the house of God, and he makes a vow to give God a tithe of all he has as a mark of appreciation for God being his God and providing for him. So now we go to Genesis chapter 29 and we begin reading about the story between Jacob and Laban. Eventually he arrives and this is the story picking up in chapter 29 beginning in verse one. It says, then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, for from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, my brothers, where are you from? And they said, we are from Haran. And he said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. And he said to them, it is well with him? And they said, it is well. And here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. So Jacob is about 75 years old at this time. And in chapter 29, we see him finally arrive at his destination. In a similar way as the servant who found his mother for his father, he arrives in the same way near a well, finds eventually the woman that will become his wife and finds out she's the daughter of his uncle, exactly what he had been looking for. Now in verses seven to 12, upon seeing Rachel, we're not going to read that, he's overcome by emotion uh, in being reunited with his family. Some people like to read this and say, oh, it was love at first sight. No, th this was not the idea. The idea is I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. I don't know where I am. This is a strange land. How am I going to find my way? And the person that he meets first is someone from his family. So, you know, it's emotional, it's relief. It's just, you ever be at the airport? I love being at the airport waiting for somebody because you're waiting for somebody, but you're watching the arrival. It's always great. Eh? It doesn't matter what nationality, I've always noticed, it doesn't matter what nationality or age or anything, rich, poor, when the person you're waiting for comes, you know, there's that look of, oh, hi, welcome, and so on. So this is kind of where we're at uh, emotionally. It says here that he kisses her, but again, not a romantic kiss, but a, a greeting like you would kiss a, a relative, you know, uh, embrace, I think, is the, is, the, 
is the word. And she, of course, goes and tells her family. So we pick it up in verse 13. He says, so when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all of these things. Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and of face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. I'm, not quite, I'm never quite sure about that answer. You know, how, uh, <laughs> if that was a compliment, you know, well, she might as well go to you, you know, to somebody else. But anyways, I think that was a way of underscoring, you know, seven years is a long time, and you, I think he was kind of downplaying that. Anyways, uh, Jacob is reunited with his uncle, stays with him. He offers his, his uncle offers him a job. Pretty easy to see that Jacob's got nothing. You know, young guy, runs away, tells his uncle the whole story. All right. You know, and it's, we find out that Laban's a pretty shrewd guy. So he offers him a job, seven years of free service in return for Rachel in marriage. And of course, in those days, a dowry needed to be provided. He had no money to provide a dowry, so he offered his, his service and labor. And this was a good deal for Laban and for Jacob, because as I say, he was without means, and so this was a way of showing his true love and value that he placed on on Rachel. Now the Bible says that Rachel was beautiful of face and form and Leah was tender-eyed, kind of a generous way of describing this woman, weak eyes. It meant she was, she was homely. She was a homely woman. She was not a beautiful woman like her sister. Um, tender in nature. So we keep reading about this story. It says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife for my time is completed that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him and Jacob went into her. Keep going. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you uh, deceived me? Uh, keep reading some more. But Laban said, it is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one and we will give you the other one for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah and he served with Laban for another seven years. Wow. Interesting that Laban doesn't make a, a move to fulfill his part of the bargain until Jacob insists on it. Notice that at the very beginning, Jacob is, has to go to Laban and say, hey, what gives? I've been working for you for seven years, nothing's happening. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yes, the seven, sure, yeah, let's, yeah, we, we got to do something about that. I mean, you know, that should have been the red flag right there. I mean, that type of uh, character, haven't we seen that at work with our managers or supervisors you know, or whatever who have given us a lot of talk up front about what a great job we're doing and yes sir, we're going to be taking care of you and this and that and uh, they're always putting you off. So that, that part of human nature, you know, that, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't change. Jacob of course is deceived in the same way as his father was deceived. You know, there's the justice, there's some sort of justice there. He's deceived in the same way his father was deceived. He was blinded by love. You know, Isaac was blinded by his love of his son Esau and his virility. He was his favorite son. And, uh, and Jacob is blinded by his love. You know, after seven years of waiting, he may not have been paying too much attention. 
<laughs> you know, I think he may have been eager to have his wife. And again, that's human nature, absolutely. Uh, she, Leah, could have been dressed and perfumed. You know, they didn't wear short shorts and, and, and t-shirts in those days. You know, the women were well covered and so on and so forth. Um, and some perfume and, uh, you know, not to mention the obvious, I mean, contact in the darkness after a feast. Do you think any wine had been drunk at that feast? So you know, we wonder, how could he have made such a mistake? Well, it wasn't like us. You know? Your bride walks down the aisle. For sure, you're going to recognize who she is, but that's not, what they, that's not the way they did things. So, and in the same way, his father Isaac had feasted before giving the blessing to the wrong son. So there's a parallel there. You know? The old story, what goes around comes around, you know? so it's coming around to Jacob. So anyways, he confronts Laban, and Laban justifies his actions based on custom. There's no apology, nothing. He says, well, what's the big deal? You know, that's the way we do things around here. So then a new agreement is made where Leah's week, seven days, is fulfilled in order to confirm her marriage. And then Jacob can have Rachel and he agrees to this. And some people say, why would he agree to this? Well, he doesn't have anything. Everything he could have accumulated for himself in seven years, he didn't because he gave him seven years of free service to obtain Rachel. He, 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 you know, he was a boarder. He had nothing for himself. So what is he going to do? Get mad and walk away? So he walks away with Leah. He has nothing, no way to support her. So he's stuck. The new agreement is made. Leah's week is fulfilled. Uh, and Jacob agrees to this, and a week later, he consummates his relationship with Rachel and stays on to work for Laban another seven years. Some interesting points about this as well. Let's remember, yes, he loved Rachel more than Leah, but he loved Leah too. He didn't not love her, he just loved Rachel more. And then, of course, Jacob could have rejected Leah, but, but instead he forgave her and he honored her. And that speaks a lot about his character. He could have, once he had Rachel, said, okay, you know, you, you're going to go sleep out in the garage. You know, and don't, don't talk to me, you know, just do your chores and just leave us alone. But he didn't do that. If we read, continue reading the story, she was included in the family. She was a wife. You know, and, and he treated her as a wife. And of course, there's no mention of it, but there must have been great suffering on Rachel's part because she was deceived as well. I mean, you know, we always say, oh, poor Jacob, he had to wait. Well, yeah, well, poor Rachel, she had to wait too. She's a human being as well, but she also accepted the circumstances. So the next verses describe the birth of Jacob's 12 sons by Leah and Rachel and their maids. This was not adultery, some people might think, because both women were his legal wives and any children he had with the maids were all legally his according to the custom of the time. It's a touchy subject. Um, this was polygamy, there's no way around it. He had two wives, two concubines. But in the time before Moses, although it was not according to God's original command in the garden and his later commands to Moses, God permitted it at the time. Okay? You know, Esau, notice Esau was condemned for marrying pagan women, not for marrying two women. And Jacob was never condemned, even rebuked for having two wives and even the two concubines. God never rebuked him for that. However, the unnaturalness of it becomes evident when we see the problems that arise. Never mind being rebuked. If you see the whole story of Jacob, you see how, man, this, this thing, is, it can't work. You know? And it doesn't, it doesn't work. So we look in 31, it says, now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived, bore a son and named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has seen my affliction, surely now my husband will uh, love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. So she named him Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. 
and she conceived again and bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she stopped bearing children. So Leah is hated in the sense that she's not the favorite. So God enables her to conceive in rapid succession. Her fertility raises her worth and her attraction to her husband. You know, her husband you know, wants children and she's producing these, these children. So she names her children accordingly. Reuben means behold a son. You know, I've given you a son. Simeon means hearing. God has heard me, he's answered my prayer. Levi means attachment. Not the child will be attached to me, my husband will be attached to me. I've given him three sons. And finally, Judah, which means praise. Not praise for the child or the mother, but praise for God, for what He has done for her. She's the unloved and homely one, but God has given her four, four sons. What I find amazing is that Levi, who would become from that tribe the high priest, and Judah, from whose tribe the Savior would come, both come from Leah. That's just an amazing thing, God, just how He works. So we see in her attitude and the names that she gives her sons that she, Leah, she loves Jacob, she actually loves him, and she desires him to be near her and that she is also a spiritual woman who has faith and trust in God. She's trusting in God, boy, she's putting her case before him. So we keep going uh, in chapter 30. It says, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God? Who has withheld from you the fruit of, uh, the, fruit of the womb? She said, here's my maid Bilhah, go into her that she may be, uh, bear on my knees that through her I too may have children. So she gave him her maid Bilhah as a wife and Jacob went into her. Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Keep going. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali. So Rachel is jealous. She had to wait for her sister to marry and now her sister is having four children with her original husband. Talk about mm, bitterness. So their argument leads to Jacob's statement that God is the one who's holding back her womb, not him. Obviously, they're, they're having conjugal, uh, conjugal uh, intimacy together and no children are coming. So she tests this by giving her maid, like Sarah had done before her, in order to see if God will answer her prayers for a child. Remember, she prays to God, give me a child, and she gives the maid to her husband, and, and God allows that child to be born, and she calls him Dan, which means justice. And in her mind, uh, she is justified. I did the right thing. I've, I've got a child. This is my child. Legally, it was her child. And then she has another child through her maid, Naphtali. Uh, his name means wrestlings signifying the struggle she's had, not with God, but with Leah. These two women are struggling with one another you know, for their husband's love and also for priority as a wife. So we keep going, verse nine. Oh yeah, there we go. There are the two names there that I mentioned. Then in verse nine it says, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her maid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him uh, she named him Gad. One more, it says, Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, happy am I, for women will call me happy. So she named him Asher. So Leah also uses the same method to continue providing children for her husband. You know, maybe the need to produce children overrode the jealousy of having him have sex with other women. I mean, human nature is the same. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that no woman enjoys watching her husband having sex with their maid. You know? I mean, human nature is not like that. 
but the, the desire to compete with her sister was so great that they were just willing to do these things and hurt themselves you know, in, the, in the process. Um, in any case, it was a way of producing a lot of children very quickly, and this was a clear advantage, not only to Jacob, but to the family itself. Zilpah has two sons. She names them uh, fortunate, uh, Gad means fortunate, and happy, Asher, which reflect her feelings about these children and her, and her situation. Keep reading here, verse 14. Now in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went out and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, therefore he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's uh, mandrakes. When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. God gave heed to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my maid to my husband. So she named him Issachar. Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good gift. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulun. Afterward, she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. So what's the mandrake? The mandrake is a small kind of orange colored berry-like fruit. It was prized in the ancient world as an aphrodisiac and a, a, for, a, a fertility inducer. And, and, and some parts of it, the roots, were used uh, many times as a narcotic. Uh, it was sometimes called the love apple, the love apple, or the may apple. Now Reuben, Leah's son, finds some, and Rachel makes a deal with Leah to send Jacob to her in exchange for these, you know, this love fruit here. Now Jacob was spending more time with Rachel and the maid than with Leah. You see the competition back and forth, always fighting. And of course Jacob, you know, you, okay, you're not sleeping with me tonight, you're, you're going over to the other tent, you know. Okay, you know, I mean, somehow he's not being very, very forthcoming here or he's not setting down any, any rules, I guess. Um, Rachel wanted the mandrakes to try to get pregnant. So she wants to get pregnant thinking these mandrakes are going to do it. So what does she do? She exchanges the mandrakes that her, daughter, uh, her sister has in exchange for her husband going to sleep with her sister, figuring that later on when her husband comes back, she'll be more fertile and be able to produce a, produce a child. So Jacob agrees. And what happens? Well, Leah gets pregnant from their union and names the child Issachar, which means reward. And this turns Jacob's attention once again to Leah. And so she conceives again and another son, Zebulun, uh, meaning dwelling. My husband's going to finally dwell with me. And then Jacob now uh, has a, a third child uh, at this time, a, a girl named Dinah, which means judgment. The idea mean God has judged in my, in my, not God is judging us because we're being bad. They're doing this thinking, yes, this competition here, who produces more children, so on and so forth, this will please our husband, I'm going to win my husband, I'm going to be the number one, the number one wife. So many years later, <clears throat> uh, Rachel will finally give birth to a son and she'll call him Joseph, which means to take away and to add, meaning that her reproach for barrenness was finally taken away and her new son added joy into her uh, life. And then much later on, she'll have a final child, Benjamin, but not in the passage that we're looking at today. So this ends the account of the birth of Jacob's family at that time. Uh, one more son, as I mentioned, and other daughters are to be born later on, but these are the main ones. So I put them down this way to uh, show you, uh, I mean, as far as production is concerned, Leah is the hands-down winner, you know what I'm saying? 
Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dinah, those were she conceived and bore those children, and then her um, maid, Gad and Asher. And then of course on Rachel's side, Joseph uh, and Benjamin, the two uh, children, and with her maid, two other children. So four, she has four and the other one has the rest. So the next time we're, uh, we're going to look at uh, when Jacob finally leaves Laban. We're going to fast forward in, you know, a couple of years and, and do that. Uh, you know, Sometimes when you read this passage, these passages, these chapters, it's, it's easy to kind of just zip through these here because it's just, okay, this woman had ba this baby, then this one had this baby, and it goes back and forth, and it's just a, you know, a battle between two women. But there, I think there are some, there's some lessons that we can learn just from this episode, and I want to share those with you. First lesson is that God is interested in your problem, whatever your problem is. You know, Jacob was alone, he was unsure, so God appears to him personally to reconfirm the blessing and to help him you know, get through that difficult moment. That was it. He must have felt like the most alone guy in the world at that moment. Leah, she was unloved and she didn't have the physical beauty to attract her husband. And she was now married to him. You, know, you ever think that maybe Leah didn't want to marry this guy? Maybe, you know, but in those days, she, she didn't have a say in that. Her father said, you know, you're, this is what, or her older brother, I suppose, this is what you're going to do, and that, that was it. You know? And maybe she felt desperate. You know, I, I'm not attractive, perhaps I won't be able to get a husband for myself. And she went along with a kind of a bad deal. And then Rachel, how do you think she felt? Cheated, I mean cheated by her own family and, and her own sister, you know, robbing her of her wedding night. I mean, wow, what a, what a grudge to carry your, your, whole, your whole life. And then, fee, and then on top of that, not being able to have children while your sister is just you know, having one child after another. So each of these people received some succor, succor, you know, some satisfaction from God for their particular problem. Certainly Jacob was cured of his loneliness. <laughs> he had plenty of women in his life and children. And Leah, in a sense, her life was you know, enriched by having these children. She couldn't see the future, but look at her children you know, the Messiah comes through her children, the high priest comes through her children. And Rachel also has a son, Joseph, you know, who God used to save the whole family, the whole, the whole promise was saved through Joseph. So I'm saying that God is interested in, in your problem, my problem, no problems too difficult, and I think we believe that, but also no problem is too insignificant. I have not heard many times in my ministry career someone say to me, oh, I, think, you know, I don't think God can handle this problem. I haven't heard that a lot, but what I have heard a lot is, God, you know, I don't want to bother him with this thing. This is too small. This is too petty. This is just my thing. You know? And he, I mean, there are wars, there are children dying, you know, and so on and so forth. Why would he want to listen to me? Well, you know, these people, this was their own personal little problem, and you know, Leah, her problem was, I'm not as beautiful as my sister. And, and God, you know, God came to her rescue. And so I think we need to remember, nothing is too human for him to intervene because he created human beings and he understands human beings. Secondly, another lesson, giving is part of thanksgiving. You know, Jacob's reaction to God's appearance was not only praise and prayer, but he dedicated himself to giving a tenth of what he had to God as a sign of his gratitude. So there was no law, by the way, at that time that said you had to give 10% of your, of your earnings or whatever, your wealth. Uh, it was simply the natural reaction of a happy and a grateful heart. So there's no real thanks without giving. That's why the offering is part of worship. You know, we give thanks and we praise and da 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 da, and then we have an offering. Why? Well, because that kind of you know, uh, is the concrete way that we demonstrate the praise and the thanks that we have. 
So what we put in the offering signifies how sincere our praise really is. And then finally, you know, yeah, roll with the punches. <laughs> roll with the punches. You know, we have ordinary people facing extraordinary situations caused by their own sins or the sins of other people. You know, Jacob and Rachel were robbed of their wedding night, Leah's humiliating marriage, uh, Jacob's additional seven years of work, not fair, not nice, not good. A strange blended family that they all lived in, kind of a weird thing to be part of. But they didn't allow a single bad or inconvenient thing to totally destroy them and to destroy their faith in God. I want you to note that each of them completed and were in conflict, uh, competed rather, and were in conflict with the other, and yet they kept calling on God as individuals for help. So maybe the point I'm trying to make is that God's people, you know, we roll with the punches knowing that the objective is not to win every round, the objective is to finish the fight. We can lose every single round and still win the fight if we're standing at the end. I tell people that. You know. Lose every round, but if you're still standing at the end, you get, you, you get the victory. Through Christ, we can roll with the punches when the going is rough and still finish as victors in the end. And Jacob's a marvelous, marvelous man. He did a lot of things wrong, but you see that he does, you know, he does have a victory at the end of his, uh, at the end of his life. Okay, so there are the, uh, the births, the many births of Jacob's wives and maids.